doing something about it. He understands that there is really no problem that we cannot solve if we work together. Entrenched violence is tough, especially gun violence, but we have to start to figure out how we're going to solve the issue. The actions we take today will make our communities a little bit safer tomorrow, and a little bit safer the next day, and the next, and the next. The pain that gun violence brings to our communities, we have to acknowledge, is not inevitable. We do not have to live with it. We can choose a different path. I've tried to choose a different path here in Pennsylvania. 2019, I signed an executive order to reduce gun violence in Pennsylvania, and that council, that Reorder also created a special council on gun violence, asking them to come up with solutions that we can actually put into place here in Pennsylvania. I, we've invested more than $50 million in gun violence and gun, prevention, gun violence prevention right here in Pennsylvania just in this year alone. And I signed legislation to prevent domestic abusers from possessing guns in Pennsylvania. Just last year, Pennsylvania, I signed with the governors of New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. We signed an agreement to share crime data across state lines. And our compact is going to help all of us do a better job of preventing gun violence in our four states. I've also created a Law Enforcement Citizen Advisory Commission. I've implemented background checks for law enforcement officers so that they have better information to know what they're dealing with. I've also signed bills into law to make our Commonwealth's justice system fairer taken action to improve access to mental health treatment in Pennsylvania, required insurers to provide mental health equity with physical health. I'm going on and on. These are things I've done, but we have not done enough. We need to do more, which is why President Biden's Safer American Plan is so important. It is the next step for us. It's something that actually can give us all some hope that we are moving at least in the right direction to make sure that gun violence is less of a problem. What his plan does, it calls for needed investments in crime prevention. It calls for changes to build a fairer justice system. It calls for common sense steps to keep guns out of dangerous hands. The plan also drives investments down into the state, for which I'm grateful, and to local areas for, their, to, for, for them to, to use that money in the ways that they see fit. This is a plan that takes advantage of the strengths of every partner at every level. It's innovative. It's built for success. So President Biden, you're going to hear from him in just a minute. That's why we're all here. I want to thank him for his leadership. I want to thank him for his vision, because this is really important. Now it is my great pleasure to turn this over to Pennsylvania's Attorney General, my friend, Josh Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You look good, Wilkes-Bear. Thank you. It's good to be with all of you here at Wilkes University. Thank you, I love you back. It's good to be with all of you here and to see your faces and to have this important conversation about public safety right here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in NEPA, as we like to call ourselves. I know as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it takes great collaboration and commitment through the community and law enforcement, coming together, trusting one another, and working together to combat crime. And it takes all of us in law enforcement, local, state, and federal, operating as a team to keep people safe and to build, as the sign says, a safer America. As I look around the room, I see a lot of friendly faces, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of faces of law enforcement. The people who put on the uniform day in and day out and run toward danger so the rest of us can be safe. Working with our partners in law enforcement, the Office of Attorney General over the last five years has arrested 8,100 drug dealers. 331 gun traffickers, and over 500 child predators who try to compromise our public safety. We have worked together to make our communities safe. We've also worked together to take bold action. Back in 2019, the Office of Attorney General sounded the alarm on ghost guns 
which have quickly become the weapon of choice for criminals on our streets. Violent felons here in Pennsylvania and across the United States of America walk up to a counter, buy a ghost gun, a lethal ghost gun, without a background check, and then wreak havoc on our community. Working together with Governor Wolf, we tried to shut down that ghost gun loophole, but then we were sued by the gun lobby. We didn't go away. We kept pushing forward. And now, because we partnered with the Biden administration, the ghost gun loophole in the United States of America is closed. It is closed. And what that means is that criminals can no longer get their hands on these lethal ghost guns and wreak havoc on our communities. I think we all recognize we must do more. A year ago, as I was traveling across our Commonwealth, talking with patrol officers and police chiefs, we heard from local police officers just how much our communities were stretched how much our law enforcement was stretched. I see the mayor of Allentown here. He was one of the people we had a conversation with. We see an historic shortfall in the number of officers and the number of recruits coming into the system. Because of the staffing shortage, understand that means local departments aren't able to make sure people are safe and feel safe at the same time. It makes it harder for a police officer to get out of their patrol car, walk the beat, learn the names of our children, see their humanity, and talk to the people who actually run the neighborhoods. The grandmoms sitting up on their porches, they're the ones who run the neighborhoods. With this level of historic shortages, it also makes it impossible to attend that community meeting, to talk to the neighbors, to make sure that law enforcement and the community are working together to keep people safe. So we've set out to try and deal with that shortage, a shortage which right now in Pennsylvania stands at at least 1,229 police officers. We need to get our departments up to full strength. That's why I've been calling for the hiring of at least 2,000 more police officers across Pennsylvania and calling on this legislature to meet the governor where he is and invest the resources necessary to keep our community safe. And while in this last budget, we secured a down payment on that investment, including, including funding that can go to hero pay to retain officers in communities like this one, we know that more needs to be done. That is why it's so critical that the president came here to Wilkes-Barre today to announce his commitment to hiring 100,000 police officers nationwide to help make us safe. And while we thank the president and the Biden administration for their efforts, the real heroes here are the people who put on the uniform every single day. We know that policing is a noble profession, and we know we need to stand with law enforcement. By making this investment, we can make our community safer, and we can make people feel safer at the same time. As Pennsylvania's chief law enforcement officer, I can tell you, we want to continue to partner with federal, state, and local law enforcement, and with the community to keep people safe. I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank you for your commitment to making our communities safe and strong, and know how much each and every one of you means to me. God bless our women and men in uniform, and keep them safe. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And now it is my absolute pleasure to bring up one of your own, our Congressman, Congressman Matt Cartwright. Anybody like Josh Shapiro here? Oh, yes, we do. 
There's a man who has dedicated himself to law enforcement, and we appreciate it. And you know, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think it is the top responsibility of elected officials to ensure public safety. We all believe it here, all of us here on the stage and all of you listening. You know that public safety is so important. And I can't tell you how much time I spend in our nation's capital bragging about our police in northeastern Pennsylvania. We don't seem to have the problems that we see in other places in the country. You know why? Our police are fantastic. They understand community policing. They understand community policing. They understand what Josh Shapiro was just talking about, seeing the humanity and everybody they come into contact with. They are members of the community. They live among the community. That's why our police are so admirable in what they do in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I see it as my job to help them, help them with resources. You know I got on the House Appropriations Committee in my second term. I'm finishing the fifth term now. I'm one of the 12 chairs of appropriations, and I intend to use that clout to help our local law enforcement, and I've been doing it. Last year, I worked with Wilkes-Barre Mayor Brown. George Brown here? I, here he is. It's got to be here. George Brown and I worked, uh, uh, along with Police Chief Coffey, to secure community project funding in the, com in the Commerce, Justice, and Science Bill for $2.1 million for long-needed equipment for Wilkes-Barre Police, including body cameras and a new gunshot detection system. That's going to be a big help. In addition, this year's CJS bill, I'm working with the Lu Luzerne County DA's office to get funding of $2.5 million for a multi-jurisdiction, countywide first responder unit to handle emergencies, complex investigations, and help smaller police departments in our area with their major cases. This is funding that is sorely needed so that these great law enforcement officials can get their job done right. This is all on top of the appropriation, yeah. It's the same thing in Lackawanna County. Uh, we have a, an increasing concern with some gang violence among young people. And, and uh, I got an appropriations funding success last year for $2 million for Lackawanna County's Gun and Gang Reduction and Crime Intelligence Project for the Lackawanna County DA, DA's office. This is just exact, exactly the type type of thing that I want to do. And in, in fact, the local police departments, they need it more than anybody. Local police and first responders, we've had successes in Monroe County, a uh, million dollars for Chestnut Hill Township's first responders and police, and in Music, three million dollars for a new police headquarters, Archibald, three million for, for one of those, Scranton, three and a half million. This is money that I intend to keep bringing back. Because it's so important that we get our fair share of our federal tax dollars working for us back here in northeastern Pennsylvania, and that's what I intend to do. We're here today to talk about keeping communities safe, productive, and livable. And that is always a welcome topic here in northeastern Pennsylvania. We know, we're not smug about it, but we know we live in the best part of America right here in northeastern Pennsylvania. And we want to keep it that way, don't we? <laughs> to that end, to that end, and we're going to hear about it with our main speaker today, I was proud to do something that I've been doing since I first got elected to Congress, working across the aisle to make progress on a problem that needs to be tackled. I voted in favor of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act because it will help us get to a safer America.
We need to focus on mental health problems, protecting against domestic violence, closing loopholes that can allow criminals unchecked access to firearms and ammunition. We have to make schools safer and get ahead of problems that are on track to end up as a shooting and stop that shooting from ever happening. That's, that's what the Safer Communities Act addresses, and I'm going to keep working on these issues because they need more work, and I'd like to keep doing it from members on both sides of the aisle. Everyone wants to make America safer. Everyone wants to find a solution to the deadly violence that has continued to rock our country, and I say that unity of purpose should be its own force to be reckoned with. What do you think? Thank you, and I want to introduce, introduce the next speaker, who since 2006 has been my senator from Pennsylvania, Senator Bob Casey. Bob Casey. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I want to start, I'm going to start with a note of gratitude. I'm going to start by thanking and we're honored by the presence of Governor Wolf, Attorney General Shapiro, and Congressman Cartwright. Let's give them another round of applause for their leadership. I want to thank each of you for being here today to have this important discussion, as the Attorney General said. We're grateful to Wilkes College, Wilkes University. I'm showing my age, Mr. President. <laughs> President Khan, thank you for having us back here and uh, rescheduling this after we had to, had to postpone it from before, uh, earlier this year. But we're grateful for your presence here today. And I also want to extend that gratitude to the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Let's give him a round of applause so he can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the list, the list of things we could thank him for is too long. But just consider over the last 18 months what has happened. And I'm only going to mention three or four pieces of legislation. The American Rescue Plan lifted up families here in Luzerne County and all across our Commonwealth. Helped a lot of communities, and yet on the other side, they all voted against it. But the President led the way and we got that done. Then came the infrastructure bill, right? That bill... That bill that will repair roads and bridges and bring high-speed internet to so many communities, we're, we're just getting warmed up with that bill. We've barely seen the impact in just the first couple of months. We're going to be building bridges and lifting up communities with that legislation for years. The president led that. It would not have become law were it not for his leadership. And finally, and then I'll get to the, the subject of today's gathering, finally, just Three weeks ago now, we passed, passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and we, in one bill, in one bill will allow us to reduce the cost of prescription drugs for seniors by allowing Medicare for the first time ever to negotiate for lower prices and capping out-of-pocket costs. They said we could never do it. We could never beat the powerful corporate lobbies. They said it would never, ever happen. They said you could never pass a bill that would take the kind of steps we took to combat climate change. They said you could never do in that same bill the kind of deficit reduction, $300 billion in deficit reduction, in making sure huge multinational corporations are paying their fair share. They said it couldn't be done. Joe Biden said yes, and we got it done. And we're here today. We're here today to talk about a safer America, a safer Pennsylvania, a safer northeastern Pennsylvania. And Congressman Cartwright walked through some of the, the issues that he's been working on, the investments he's made with his leadership. But this legislation, the, the Safer Communities Act, was one of those bills which they, they also said can never be passed, that you can never in Washington, because it hasn't happened in 
my lifetime, except one, one other time. You can never beat the gun lobby. They are too big, they are too powerful, you cannot beat them. Well, President Biden and Democrats and a few, a few Republicans came together with us and they decided to say, no, we're gonna get this done. We're gonna make sure that we don't surrender to gun violence. That's what Washington's been doing for too long, surrendering to the problem of gun violence. We don't do that in America. You look at the sweep of American history, whether it was war or depression or pandemic or whatever, whatever is come in front of us, whatever challenge has been presented to the American people, we don't surrender to gun violence. We take it on and we make progress. But there are some in Washington who still want to surrender to the gun lobby, still want to surrender the problem, saying it's too complicated. It's been around a long time. We just have to get used to it. Well, we're not going to surrender. We're going to be here for safety, not surrender. And here's what the bill does. It enhance back, enhances background checks for 18 to 20-year-olds. It provides federal money for crisis intervention, like extreme risk protection orders in states. A lot of states might want to do it, didn't have the money to do it until this bill came along. It also addresses dating, the dating partner loophole so that women across the country were threatened by a dating partner. Working, making progress on that, still more to do on that issue as well. Funding community violence intervention programs, cracking down on gun trafficking, on and on and on. And guess what? Almost $11 billion, 10.8 to be exact, $10.8 billion for mental health. That has never happened in Washington in my lifetime. Never. And again, they said it couldn't be done. You can't beat the gun lobby. You can't beat the corporate lobbies. Well, it's President Joe Biden has shown with his leadership that we can take on any tough problem. Not solve it in one bill, not solve it with one action, but make good progress as Americans always do. So we're grateful that he has demonstrated that kind of leadership. Not surrendering to a pandemic, not, not surrendering to economic challenges, and not surrendering to the plague of gun violence. We believe in safety. We're Americans. We're going to get this done. God bless you.
please welcome the mayor of Scranton, Paige Cognetta. You know, we were thinking, the president's coming, what can we do to make this day special? So at our recent pop-up city halls, we had coloring sheets for kids, and we asked them the question, why do you love Scranton? And so many of them said, the people. Lovely people, people who help each other. This community has each other's backs. And we know that our president, Joe Biden, knows this. It is part of his DNA and we see it in all of the incredible legislation that he has put through as President of the United States. Today, we're here to talk about the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act to give us the resources in cities like Scranton and Wilkes-Barre throughout Northeastern Pennsylvania and this whole Commonwealth to fight violence, to prevent violence, to interrupt violence, to make our kids safer, to help our schools be safer. And the president knows how important this is because he is from here, because he knows that we have to have each other's backs as a community if we are going to thrive. It is an honor for us to be here today to welcome him home to celebrate this landmark legislation. And I want to introduce someone that I have worked with across the aisle of Luzerne and Lackawanna counties <laughs> since day one when we took office just two years ago. And that's Wilkes-Barre Mayor, Mayor George Brown. How do I upbeat Mayor Paige Cognati? I don't think I can, but I'm going to try. Folks, go ahead, have a seat, please. Down. Yes, we're here today, and Joe Biden is here today. And Joe Biden is here for us because he cares about Wilkes-Barre, Luzerne County, and all the residents in the state of Pennsylvania. As mayor, on behalf of the residents of the city of Wilkes-Barre, I'm honored to welcome President Joe Biden. I first met President Biden in his hometown of Scranton last October, and I said, Mr. President, please come to Wilkes-Barre. We have a beautiful city. And guess what? He kept his promise. He's here today. I want to thank the members of the Biden-Harris administration for making this visit possible. I truly believe that President Biden's childhood in northeastern Pennsylvania was the foundation for his history of leadership and rise to commander-in-chief. The citizens of northeastern Pennsylvania are resilient, and they truly care about their neighbors, much like President Joe Biden. Mr. Biden has stood up for the American people through the implementation of the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. These initiatives are investments that make our community stronger, healthier, and safer. By implementing multiple programs through the American Rescue Plan funds, my administration was able to financially assist residents, businesses, and nonprofits most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. With a focus on public safety, we're able to utilize the planned funds to enhance public safety for residents, businesses, and owners of businesses throughout the entire community. Now, the American Rescue Plan funds have allowed our police to obtain updated equipment, 
to serve and protect the city of Wilkesbury. We're able to purchase 10 new police cars. We're buying 10 bicycles, so our police will be on bicycles in the neighborhoods, pure community policing. And we've also purchased other visibility uh, intel that we're going to be using, things like cameras that will be on body cameras that we have now on all of our officers. But also, we're going to be increasing the uh, technology by purchasing a gunshot detection technology throughout the city of Wilkesbury. This is all done as a result of President Biden's efforts. We welcome the President's initiatives through the Safer America Plan. We will promote a safer community by ensuring that our police department always has the most updated equipment and training. In closing, I'm appreciative of President Biden's visit to Wilkes-Barre today, and even more so, the long-lasting benefits of the American Rescue Plan and the paths towards a safer Wilkes-Barre through his Safer America Plan. Now, it's my honor to introduce to you President Joe Biden. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Before you walk down, I wanted the Casey's to come up with me because where I come from, Scranton's Casey's the country. We, we got raised in the same neighborhood in Greenridge, not far from two of the best little candy shops in the, in the, in the whole country. And I just wanted to let, I, they can't deny me. That's why I wanted them up here. I want them to know. And by the way, this guy is, has more integrity in his little finger than most people have in their whole body. That's why I love working with him. Welcome home. <laughs> and, and like me, he married way up. <laughs> way up. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As my mother, Jean Finnegan Biden from Greenridge would say, please excuse my back when I'm speaking. I apologize. And by the way, you know one of the best things of all being president of the United States is the Marine Band. They're the best in the world. Stand up, guys. They are the very, 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 very best. They can not only play, they know how to fight, too. <laughs> God love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. How are you, baby? How old are you? How old are you? Almost double figures. Well, look, folks, it's great to be here in Wilkes-Barre. I mean that sincerely. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Mayor Brown, thank you for the introduction and the passport into this great city. And uh, Mayor Cognetti, it's almost, we're almost near, we're almost in heaven. We're almost in Scranton. <laughs> almost. Being raised in Scranton, they said, are you going down the line? any rate, you know, uh, and what a leadership lineup you have here in Pennsylvania. I want to thank your outstanding governor, Tom Wolf. Tom and I have been friends a long time. He's truly one of the best governors in the United States of America. Not a joke. Not a joke. And a stand-up guy. A stand-up guy. And Josh Shapiro is a champion for the rule of law as your attorney general. And he's going to make one hell of a governor. I really mean it. And by the way, he couldn't be here today. We spoke, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. He's, when I say he's a powerful voice, I used to be in the old days a pretty good athlete. And if someone was really big and tough, you'd say, I wouldn't screw with him if I had a sledgehammer. 
Well, I tell you what, Fetterman's a hell of a guy, a powerful voice for working people, and he's going to make a great United States senator. He's going to make a great United States senator. And as I said, Bobby Casey is one of my closest friends, one of our great United States senators. And your congressman, Matt Cartwright, is the real reason I'm here. I'm in Cartwright country. He knows how to deliver for this district, which is so close to my heart. Look, I especially want to thank all the members of law enforcement that are here, many of whom are behind me, for always being there for us. And we should always be there for them. And by the way, also a group that you need badly, you don't really appreciate till you need them, is the firefighters. The firefighters have been with me my whole career. And let me tell you something. There's an old expression. God made man, then he made a few firefighters. Because you got to be crazy to be a firefighter. <laughs> by the way, please sit down. I'm, I'm sorry. Please sit down. I keep forgetting. <laughs> I uh, thank you. But look, when I ran for president, I said I looked at the world the way I looked at it growing up in Scranton, and that wasn't hyperbole. I meant that. The families, what families wanted was in Scranton when I was growing up with my mom and dad and my grandpa was the basic, basic, basic as it is today. A decent job. The opportunity to be treated with dignity. Everyone, my dad would say, everybody. Everybody's entitled to be treated with dignity. Just simple dignity. The fact is that they want to be able to go to good schools safe, in safe neighborhoods, a decent place to live, and just a fair shot, just a fair shot for their kids. You know, a peace of mind knowing your kids can go to school or the playground or the movies or the high school game and come home safely and not have to think about it. But for too long, too many families haven't had that peace of mind. They watch the news and they see kids being gunned down in schools and on the streets. Almost every single night you turn the news on, that's what you see. They see their neighbors lose their loved ones to drugs like fentanyl, which is a flat killer. They see hate and anger and violence just walking the streets of America. And they just want to feel safe again. They want to feel a sense of security. And that's what my crime plan is all about. You know, I call it the Safe for America's plan, and both your members of Congress voted for it. It's based on a simple notion. When it comes to public safety in this nation, the answer is not defund the police, it's fund the police. Fund the police. And give them, we expect them to do everything. We expect them to be, to protect us, to be psychologists, and to be sociologists. I mean, we expect you to do everything. I'm not joking. Everything. You realize more police officers are killed dealing with domestic violence than anything else? You realize that? The point is, we ask so much of you, so much of you. I've not met a cop who likes a bad cop. There's bad in everything. There's lousy senators, there's lousy presidents, there's lousy doctors, there's lousy lawyers. No, I'm serious. But I don't know any police officer that feels good about the fact that there may be a lousy cop. And I'm tired of not giving the kind of help they need. Folks, look, we're in a situation in this country where we have to give them additional resources they need to get their job done. Matt gets it, Matt Cartwright, and I'm not, this is not hyperbole. Matt's the chair of the powerful subcommittee that controls the funding for public safety. He knows what it means investing in effective and accountable community policing that builds public trust and strengthens public safety. I'm old enough to remember when cops used to walk the beat in Wilmington and in Scranton because they knew everybody. They knew the kid. They knew if something was trouble, they knew whose house to go and knock on the door and say, Mom, your son just did. I'm, being, I'm not being facetious. They knew the neighborhoods. As part of the American Rescue Plan, I signed in the law last year, which they voted for, we set aside $350 billion, with a B, billion dollars for state and local governments all across America and urged them to use it like your governor did, 
to make communities safer. Here in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf is using $250 million of that money to reduce crime and violence across this state. And, and Mayor Brown, and Mayor Brown just described how it's helping fund community policing here in Wilkesbury. But guess what? Every single Republican member of Congress, every single one in this state, every single one voted against the support for law enforcement. They talk about how much they love it. They voted against the funding, flat out, flat out. Every Republican in the House, every Republican in the Senate, every single one. I know we expect so much from our law enforcement officers, so we need to support them. That's why my crime plan to help communities recruit, hire, and train nationwide more than 100,000 additional officers, accountable officers for community policing. And I mean it. Folks, when it comes to fighting crime, we know it works. Officers on the street who know the neighborhood, not a joke, who know the neighborhood, who know the families they're protecting, who get the training they need to be able to do their jobs well, who work to earn the community's trust. And as we hire more police officers, there should be more training, more help, and more accountability. Without public trust, law enforcement can't do its job serving and protecting all the communities. If I can inter just interject for a moment, my deceased son, Bo, he was the Attorney General of the state of Delaware. And what he used to do is go down on the east side, the, what called the bucket, highest crime rate in the country. There's a place where I used to, I was the only white guy that worked as a lifeguard down in that area, on the east side. And you know where the, you can always tell where the best basketball in the state is and the best basketball in the city is. It's where everybody shows up. He'd go down and hang out and sit on a bench with my, my grandson, who's now 17 years old. And the police used to be in the car, the local city police. And he'd walk up and bang in the window. He'd say, get out of the car, damn it, meet these people. Let them see you. Let them know you. Let them know who you are. Well, the truth was, remember what happened to community policing? We went from having enough cops on the street to cities doing well and then deciding they don't need more police officers. So they reduced the police forces. So you didn't have two cops in every vehicle. You had one cop in every vehicle. And I don't blame one cop for not getting out in some certain neighborhoods, not getting out of the car. And what happens is it used to be, I can remember that when my son was the attorney general, he'd go around in the tougher neighborhoods, and he would ensure that every single cop gave his cell phone number to the local liquor store owner, the local church, the local grocery store, the local hamburger joint. So if there's a problem, they pick up the phone and call. Because what do people not want to do in tough neighborhoods? They don't want to be the one identified as turning so-and-so in. I remember going on the east side in Wilmington in one of those old Victorian three-story apartment buildings and going up to see a woman whose name, she's passed away, but won't mention her name now. And stand in that rotunda, that, that part that stuck out around the building, and she'd say, Joey, I know. I know what's going on. They all plan it downstairs. I can hear them. But I'm afraid to tell anybody. I'm afraid to tell anybody. The gangs. And so I got her so that I got a phone number for the local cops. She'd call. They promised not to identify her because they knew there'd be retribution. And the crime rate began to drop for real, not a joke. You got to know people. You got to know and you got to be able to trust the police. The police have to be able to trust the community. But we slipped away from that. We have a hell of a lot fewer cops today than we did when I wrote that initial crime bill. But now we got to get back to it. And by the way, I'm not making the case there aren't bad cops. There's some really lousy cops. There's some really lousy doctors. There's some really lousy lawyers. I mean it. But here's the point. As we've seen too often, public trust is frayed and is broken. And it undermines public safety when it gets frayed. It literally undermines safety. Families across the country have to ask, why in this nation, for example, so many black Americans wake up 
knowing they could lose their life just by living their lives. If you come from neighborhoods like I come from and down in Delaware, if you have a 16 or 17 year old son and you get the driver's license, you sit down and say, look, if you get stopped, put your hands on the wheel. Don't do anything. Just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. But here's the point. Simply jogging, sleeping on their homes. You know, they made headlines or not, they've lot of lost souls. Increased trust makes policing more effective and it strengthens public safety. And the communities, by the way, that want the police more than any other community are the tough, poor communities. Black, white, immigrants, they need the help. They want the help. It's not they don't want it. They want the help. Without that, victims don't call for help. Witnesses don't step forward. Crimes go unsolved. Justice isn't served. I took executive action, which I'm allowed to do as president. I always admired governors can take executive action. But all kidding aside, to make some of these reforms for federal officers, I couldn't do it for state officers. One, no federal officer is allowed to use a chokehold. No federal officer can restrict, there's restricted no-knock warrants. We created a national database for officers who have misbehaved and been held accountable so they can't hide. My plan will help make sure that state and local governments adopt these same reforms. And my plan does something else really important. It addresses the opioid epidemic. You notice how many people are dying of opioid overdoses now? And by the way, laced with fentanyl? The Attorney General Shapiro can tell you more about that you never want to know for a fact, for real. It's been, he's been such a strong leader on this. But we're going to impose tougher penalties for deadly fentanyl trafficking. That's poisoning communities across this country. This is a key part of the unity agenda I'm announcing in my, that I announced in my State of the Union address. We can do this. We have to do this. We'll make America safer. My plan also takes common sense action to reduce gun violence and violence overall. It builds on the progress we made this summer when I signed into law the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the most significant gun safety law we passed in 30 years. It took 30 years. And we beat the NRA. We took them on and we beat the NRA straight up. <clears throat> You have no idea how intimidating they are to elected officials. The NRA was against it, which means the vast majority, the vast majority of Republicans in Congress couldn't even stand up and vote for it because they're afraid of the NRA. It's not unusual. Every Democrat, Republican senators, they, they get afraid of certain interest groups. They voted against it. Law enforcement supported it. Faith leaders and teachers supported it. Victims of gun violence and their families supported it. Young people in this country, like the students at the great, this great university, supported it. And the NRA and the vast majority of congressional problems voted against it, saving lives and keeping America safe. But guess what? We took on the NRA and we're going to take them on again, and we won. And we will win again. But we're not stopping here. I'm determined to ban assault weapons in this country. Determined. I did it once before, and I'll do it again. For many of you home, I want to be clear. It's not about taking away anybody's guns. In fact, we should be treating responsible gun owners as examples how every gun owner should behave. I have two shotguns at home. I can't, it's a long story, but I not oppose the guns. But I support the Second Amendment, and I support the Second Amendment. But the Second Amendment, as one of the most, one of the most conservative justices in history, Justice Scalia once wrote, like, quote, like most rights, the rights granted by the Second Amendment are not unlimited. They're not unlimited. <laughs> right now, you can't go out and buy an automatic weapon. You can't go out and buy a cannon. And for those brave right-wing Americans who say it's all about keeping America, keeping America's independent and safe, if you want to fight against the country, you need an F-15. You need something a little more than a gun. 
No, I'm not joking. Think about this. Think about the rationale we use that's used to provide this. And who are they shooting at? Shooting at these guys behind me. Folks, look. I went to every major school shooting around the, in the country since I was a chairman of the Judiciary Committee all the way through as vice president and president. Over 48,000 people died from gunshot wounds in 2021 in the United States of America. Over 26,000 by suicide. When guns are the number one killer, listen to this, now, the guns are the number one killer of children in America, of children and number one. More children die from guns than active duty police and active duty military personnel combined. Hear that again? More children in America die from guns than active duty police and active duty military in the United States combined. We have to act. We have to act for those families in Buffalo, Uvalde, Newtown, El Paso, Parkland, Charleston, Las Vegas, Orlando. I've been to every one of those sites. Sit down with those parents. I spent four hours last time. Met with every single one of the parents and families that lost someone. See the looks in their faces. Think about it. Think about the devastation that's occurred. We have to act for all those kids gunned down on our streets every single day that never make the news. There's a mass shooting every single day in this country, in the streets of America, every single day. You have to ask, you have to act so our kids can learn to read in school instead of learning to duck and cover. Literally, schools all across America. Kids are showing up. The psychological damage done to our kids, not just COVID, but COVID, what it's impacted and how it's impacted us. And on top of that, a child going to school, children see this on television. You know, we're living in a country awash with weapons of war. Weapons that weren't designed to hunt are designed to take on an enemy. They're, that's what they were designed to do. For God's sake, what's the rationale for these weapons outside of a war zone? They inflict severe damage. When I was recently in Uvalde, I almost hesitate to say to some of the kids in here, you know what some of the parents had to do? Supply DNA. Supply DNA. His AR-15 just rips the body apart. Could not identify, could not identify the body. A 20-year-old kid can walk in and buy one? DNA to say that's my baby. What the hell's the matter with us? No, I'm not joking. Think about it. What are we doing? And by the way, how many, my dad used to love to hunt in the Poconos when we lived in Scranton. How many deer or bear wearing Kevlar vests? Huh? Not a joke. Do you realize the bullet out of an AR-15 travels five times as rapidly as a bullet shot out of any other gun. Five times is lighter and can pierce Kevlar. Imagine being a parent, not just losing a child, but not being able to physically identify the child or the adult because they've literally been blown apart. We equip, we equip our service members with the most lethal weapons on earth to protect all of us, protect Americans. But we require them to receive significant training, extensive background checks, mental health assessments. They have to learn how to lock up and store their weapons responsibly or they get kicked out. But we let any stranger an 18-year-old walk in, a 20-year-old, and buy an AR-15. 
That's why back in 1994, I took on the NRA and passed the assault weapons ban. For 10 years, mass shootings were down, 10 years in a row since I passed that legislation in 1994 as a, chair, as a senator. But in 2004, Republicans let that ban expire. What happened? Mass shootings in America tripled, tripled. It's time to ban these. It's time to ban these weapons. We did it before. We can do it again. Folks. Time to hold every elected official's feet to the fire and ask them, are you for banning assault weapons, yes or no? Ask them. If the answer is no, vote against them. Look, I'm prouder that after seven years, we finally have a Senate-confirmed Director of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, responsible for any gun crimes for seven years. The other team would not let us appoint anyone to that job. Incredibly important job to help local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, identify the ballistics, a whole range of things. For seven years, we finally got a pass this time out, barely. Seven years because didn't, they didn't want anybody in that job. My plan gives the Bureau the funding to hire more agents, to stop gun trafficking. And by the way, there's a lot of states that don't allow you to purchase certain weapons in the state. They just cross the state line and go buy it next door, bring it across the state line. Keep guns out. Of, you know what the Mexicans are? Mexico, which has real problems causing us real problems, you know what their biggest complaint is? Can't we stop gun, gun, gun trafficking across the southern border into Mexico? There are certain gun dealers that are basically, not gun dealers, they're wholesalers, providing the weapons to anybody who have the money. Folks, look, we can help local law enforcement. We can solve more gun crimes if we have the someone heading up, which we finally do, this organization that's designed to track this kind of behavior. Finally, my plan invests in crime prevention programs that help keep young people from getting in trouble in the first place. Under my plan, communities can, one, provide after-school and summer job programs they get paid for, more access to mental health and drug counseling, more social workers and housing to keep people off the streets instead of when they get out of when they got out of jail, they get $0.25 cent dollars on a bus ticket and they end up under the same bridge that they were under before. <laughs> this will help prevent crime, get young people to pick up paychecks instead of a pistol. At the same time, we need to help people getting out of prison successfully re-enter society so they don't get in trouble again. If you served your time, you shouldn't be designed, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be deprived of being able to, if you've served it, you shouldn't be deprived of being able to get a Pell Grant to go to school. You shouldn't be able to, to get a degree. What's the best thing you can do? Make them productive. They should get access to good jobs where they can earn a decent living. All these steps will prevent crime, not increase it. Let me close with this. A safer America requires all of us to uphold the rule of law, not the rule of any one party or any one person. Let's be clear. You hear some of my friends in the other team talking about political violence and how it's necessary. Think about this now. Did any of you think, even as old as I am, you've ever been in an election where we talk about it's appropriate to use force, political violence in America? It's never appropriate. Never. Period. Never, never, never. No one should be encouraged to use political violence. None whatsoever. And look, you know, if we're in a situation where, to this day, 
the MAGA Republicans in Congress defend the mob that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Defend them. They all saw it. I don't care how frustrated you are. You know, when I showed up, one of the things I learned as president, even though I'd been vice president for eight years and done a great deal of the foreign policy for the administration, I showed up at a meeting of the major democracies called the G7. And I sat down. It was in England. And I sat down for this three-day conference, and I said, America's back. And Macron, president of France, turned to me and said, for how long? For how long? They made a discussion with Schmidt and all that. I mean, just for how long? And one of them said to me, imagine, Joe, if you turned on the television in Washington, D.C., and saw a mob of a thousand people storming down the hallways of the parliament, breaking down the doors, trying to overturn an outcome of election and killing several police officers in the meantime. Imagine. Imagine what you'd think. Think about what the world saw. Not what we saw, what the world saw. Do you ever think the United States that would happen? What I find even more incredible is the defense of it. Cops attacked and assault, assaulted, speared with flagpole with flagpoles, sprayed with mace, stomped on, dragged, brutalized. Police lost their lives as a result of that day. Police lost their lives. One of the officers said it was worse than anything he had experienced in war in Iraq. So let me say this to my MAGA Republican friends in Congress. Don't tell me you support law enforcement if you won't condemn what happened on the 6th. Don't tell me. Can't do it. For God's sake, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Look, you're either on the side of a mob or the side of the police. You can't be pro-law enforcement and pro-insurrection. You can't be a party of law and order and call the people who attacked the police on January 6th patriots. You can't do it. What are we teaching our children? It's just that simple. And now it's sickening to see the new attacks on the FBI threatening the life of law enforcement agents and their families for simply carrying out the law and doing their job. Look, I want to say this as clear as I can. There's no place in this country, no place, for endangering the lives of law enforcement. No place. None, never, period. I'm opposed to defunding the police. I'm also opposed to defunding the FBI. Look, there's no greater responsibility for government than ensuring the safety of our people. Every parent should be able to know when their kid leaves home to go to school or just walk the street, they're going to come home safely. We can do this. We have to do this. We just need to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And when we are united, there is not a single thing we can not do. Not a single thing. I mean it. So, folks, let's remember who in God's name we are. I really mean it. What our values are. What we believe. We the people. That's how our Constitution starts, our, the Declaration. We the people. It's who we are. And by the way, no one expects politics to be a patty cake. It sometimes gets mean as hell. 
But the idea you turn on the television and see senior senators and congressmen saying, if such and such happens, there'll be blood in the street. Where the hell are we? Well, that's all I'm looking for. And folks, do me a favor. <laughs> Presumptuous of me to say that. But think about doing me a favor. Please, please, elect the Attorney General of the Senate. <laughs> elect that big old boy to be governor. And by the way, there are a lot of really, and I mean this, I'm not being solicitous. Remember what used to be the criticism of Biden when I was running? Biden's too bipartisan. Biden has too many Republican friends. There's a lot of Republicans I've worked with for all the years in the Senate. I got a lot done. We respected each other. When we disagreed, we disagreed on principle. We then went and had lunch together. Not a joke. What in God's name has happened to that in the United States of America? So, folks, let's bring it back. We can do this. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.